Welcome to Real Time, the podcast for realtors and about issues affecting realtors. Brought to you by the Canadian Real Estate Association. I'm your host, Aaron Davis, and today we have a guest you probably know and who's here to impart some of his trade secrets to help you every step along the way. We might be living in a digital age, sure, but a career in real estate is still personal. Buyers and sellers depend on realtors to not only guide, inform, and advise, but to assure and reassure an emotional need. Succeeding as a realtor requires a strong knack for connection, the ability to build trust, a commitment to immersing yourself in a client's vision so you can help them achieve it. In short, you need to communicate. And we have one of Canada's best communicators, longtime TSN anchor and sports journalist, James Duthie, to share some valuable insight to help us all. On this episode of Real Time, we'll explore a fundamentally human experience, conversation. How can realtors better connect with clients and prospective clients on a personal level? How can you find common ground to instill trust? What questions should be asked and not asked? And how can you become a better listener? Pairing knowledge and expertise with the right conversation skills can give realtors a professional edge. And that's what we're here to talk about. Thanks so much for joining us, James. We're so happy to be talking with you here. And not about sports for a change. How does that feel? Uh, It is uh, somewhat of a thrill, Aaron. I I love my job. (laughs) I love the people that watch me on TV. But you do get a lot in my world of, so the least power play, what do you think? (laughs) I bet. Okay, I do have to ask you, if you could only work with one sport, you're going to be totally focused on one sport the rest of your career, which is it, James? That answer would have changed over the years, and uh, I would probably say now golf, because that's become my obsession. I've always loved golf, but I think as I get older, it's my favorite thing to play. It's the only thing I really still play, because I've, my body's gotten too old for hockey and, and football, and and I get too beat up for that. So uh, it would probably be golf. There's something about, I was at the Canadian Open back in June, I got to do the Masters back in April. And there's just something wonderful about being at a golf course. Uh, and it just doesn't feel as much like work, even though it is. The days are very long there. So I'd probably go with golf, but I still love my hockey and my football and everything else. Well, you mentioned football. So let's start out with that, going back to early in your career and before your career. Uh, tell us how it took shape. And here you are now, one of Canada's favorite sportscasters. So, James, where did it begin? Well, I think Aaron, like most sportscasters, you'd find our failed athletes. And, mm-hmm. and I was one of those. I was a delusional high school football player who truly believed that I was going to play for the San Francisco 49ers. I was going to go to Clemson University because I think I fell in love with a cheerleader who had a paw on her face uh, when I was in about grade 11. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I was determined to go to Clemson after I saw that one cheerleader. And uh, I, I, I just, I really thought, I mean, I was a decent high school football player, but I think it was somewhere along the way in, in grade 13, remember when that existed, that mm-hmm. uh, I realized I was, uh, you know, barely 5'10 and 145 pounds with mediocre <laughs> speed and talent. And the Niners probably weren't looking for that. And so I remember going into my guidance counselor's office and saying, I I don't think I can make it as an athlete, so I'd love to do something in sport. And she plunked it into her computer and sports marketing and sports administration came up, a bunch of different programs and journalism came up. And I I, I guess I'd probably had it in my mind. I was probably one of those kids who who did, you know, turn down the TV and do play by play a little in high school, I suppose. And so that's that's where I went. And uh, that's how I ended up here. How did you get noticed by TSN because somebody doesn't just start at a major sports network or did it even exist then? Well, not when I started, no. Uh, Most sports jobs were, you know, the local guys at your local CTV or CBC station who had been there forever. And I actually couldn't get a job in sports. I, I was lucky enough to get a job at the CTV station in Ottawa right out of school, but as a news reporter. So I spent seven years covering politics and murders and fires and boring city council meetings and all those things, all the while kind of still dreaming about doing sports. I got to do uh, a little bit of sports in Ottawa, and I guess that's where, you know, 
by luck, some a TSN executive was watching me one night and gave me a phone call and I sent him a tape and I had an audition and uh, they actually didn't hire me the first time. And I took a job out in Vancouver and actually went back to news reporting. And then I remember I really wanted to live in BC and uh, uh, I told the guy when he said, I can't hire you now, but I'd love to hire you someday. I said, well, I'm moving out to BC to take a job there and, you know, don't call me for a couple of years because I want to live the BC life. And he called me in six mm-hmm. months and yeah. uh, and offered me what really was my dream job. So much to my wife's chagrin, we uh, we moved back east. Somebody, and I believe it was Oprah, who said that luck is when preparation meets opportunity. And so you got that opportunity, but you had the preparation. You put in those Malcolm Gladwell 10,000 hours probably (laughs) with all those interviews and the boring city council and all that kind of stuff, would you say? I think so. And actually, I I really think that I don't think I would have gotten the opportunity at TSN and all the opportunities I've had since without those years in news. Being a news reporter is a really fascinating thing. You you basically go into work every day and get assigned a topic, and your job is to learn as much about that topic in one day as possible. And it's you know a fascinating way to meet so many different people in different lines. It makes you a better interviewer, I think. It makes you a better writer for the job. So I think that the skills I developed in news ended up being critical in sports and probably were the key to any success that I've had. And not only do you have to be a good dancer, and of course, you're tap dancing there in front of a live audience through all kinds of different circumstances and challenges, but you need to be the choreographer, the dance captain who, in the case of a panel, for example, people probably think, as they do with anything that is done well, talent makes it look easy, but it's not, James. So what about coordinating panels and the different talents, go ahead, don't be humble, (laughs) that are required to do what you do and make it look so easy? Yeah, I think it's kind of like being a traffic cop. You're kind of uh, somewhat the conductor of this little four-minute orchestra in the intermission of a hockey game or after a golf round or a football game or whatever it may be. And you're, you're so right. You get all these different personalities. Some, some guys want to talk the whole time. You get some ex-hockey players in there that it's hard to get a couple of sentences out of. And your job is to balance those to maybe, you know, shut up the guy who wants to talk all the time and get more out of the guy who doesn't talk as much and make it hopefully flow like a seamless, casual conversation. In the end, that's what you are is basically a professional conversationalist is to hopefully make some hockey topic or football or whatever it may be and just have a good conversation, hopefully a lively conversation, sometimes a debate, sometimes not, and that is hopefully appealing to the viewers at home. And that's that's essentially what I do. It's hardly rocket science, I think, sometimes. It's just basically trying to have good conversations. Well, it's almost like a dinner party, too. If you're hosting a dinner party, I definitely either want to be at the table or to be listening in on the conversation because you're bringing the best out of everybody who's there at the table. So who's the talker in your household, James? Oh, I mean, unfortunately, my biggest problem, my wife often reminds me, is that I talk in my broadcast voice uh, at dinner Ah. dinner. Which will, you know what I mean? I can't, you're not supposed to bring your work home, but I'll be telling a story and I'll be like, yeah, so in the third period, you won't believe what happened. I'm, and she's like, honey, you're not on TV anymore. All right. You just, <laughs> it's just me and the kids and the dogs and uh, you don't have to yell like that. Uh, I think in, in our family, it's mixed around. I have some pretty bubbly personalities. I, I guess I do talk loud when I talk, but I'm actually fairly quiet, I think, away from things. I, I always feel like, you know, sometimes you have to play in these uh, charity golf events when you are the uh, quote unquote celebrity. And I always. Oh, eat, those eat, used to be oh, awful. I know. I'm I used sure. to get stuck in that fourth spot, and I'm a terrible <laughs> golfer, James. And they're all looking to see, oh, is Doug Gilmore in our. Oh, no, it's not. <laughs> oh, is it going to be Wendell? James Doug in. The, oh, we got this woman. No, in- try, I'm, oh. the, I'm the same way, Aaron, where, first oh. of all, they expect you to be a great golfer. And, and I'll say this right away that being a professional sportscaster does not mean you're a great athlete. More in a moment with TSN host James Duthie, exploring the art of conversation. And you know what? It was at a charity event at which I first met James years ago. He was telling a very personal story while also helping to raise money for a cause that was important to our community. 
Of course, as a realtor, you know what I'm talking about. And if you're ever looking for ideas on how you can light a spark of inspiration, follow Realtors Care on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And be sure to share your own stories using hashtag Realtors Care. Back now to TSN's James Duthie and the joy of having a virtual map, but also going off-road when you're conducting a conversation. Talking about someone who is talented, as you are, when you see someone who's not, it tends to stick out now like a sore thumb. And I think one of the things that we notice, and probably were guilty of early in our careers, and I'll ask if you were, is having a set of questions and sticking to them. Right. And this translates to conversation of all kinds, because we are talking about the art of conversation today, mm -hmm. which means that this is where I'm quiet and let you answer. And I will. But it's that list of questions that some don't deviate from. Tell us about those as road maps or guidelines, or do you just chuck them out the window, James? I think I learned that lesson in my first year of doing television at Carleton University. And I was operating the camera uh, and my, my colleague, my fellow student was doing the interview and she had this wonderful long list of questions. She was very thorough and I was just listening to what the guy was saying. And she was so focused on getting every single question she'd written down out that she wasn't listening to the answer. And it wasn't like I was some brilliant interviewer then, but I remember clicking in to saying, wow, she's missing all these opportunities here to ask some good questions. And I guess that stuck with me. And I, I think that's probably the most critical thing in not only in interviews, but in any sort of conversation is listening. And when we do that, and a lot of journalists, I think, do that is they write down their questions and they're so focused on, on getting to that next question that they, they don't really listen to the answers, which usually lead to the best questions. And so I've developed in the habit over years of doing interviews, I will write down questions and I still hand write my questions, because I always feel like there's a better connection between the hand and the brain than if I'm writing them in my phone or on my computer or my iPad or whatever. So I'm, I'm really old school that way. Almost everything I do in television, I write down. We don't use a teleprompter in our studio or anything. So I will just write down handwritten notes of some of the things I'd like to say, and hopefully it comes out decently on TV. But I find I remember it better that way. So I'll write a list of questions for an interview, and I'll go over them a couple of times. But then I'll never pull out that piece of paper. I'll keep it in my pocket and maybe I have some sort of safety mechanism that I know what's in my pocket if I need it and if I freeze. But for the most part, I will just try to listen and ask the questions based on that. And it served me well over the years. And I think, you know, the great interviewers that you see on television, whether it's, you know, somebody like Oprah or whatever, it's the same thing, right? They're just listening and all their follow-up questions end up are the ones that get the best answers. So, I think that's a crucial tool, whether it's in journalism or broadcasting or anywhere else in life, is to just listen to the person you're talking to. And I am listening. And we're going to keep <laughs> talking about conversation. But I have to go back to something you just said. Are you a rarity or unique in that you don't have a teleprompter in the studio, James? Uh, I think it's it's fairly common now with sports studio shows. I don't think it's very common in news. And I will argue for my industry that I think sports broadcasters are some of the best broadcasters out there because there's such a live element to everything we do in sports. Mm -hmm. And, you know, from the beginning, my, my first day when I got to TSN, I, I'd done some low anchoring for sports and news at the stations and there was always a teleprompter. And I remember getting to TSN and my first job was hosting CFL football games and uh, they quickly told me there was going to be no prompter. And I probably was scared at first, but Hmm. quickly realized that that's the best way to have conversations. So that's been that way for my whole career. If you're watching the show Sports Center, the highlight show, they have a teleprompter, but any of the other shows we do do not. And I much prefer it that way. I, I Going back to what we were talking about, about having normal conversations, I think it's really difficult to have those when they're all on a teleprompter, right? Absolutely. How are you doing today? What did you think about that first half of football? So, dot, dot, dot. Yeah. So, <laughs> now, and the other thing is I think it keeps your brain sharper because you are a little bit naked to the world. If you do forget what you're going to say, 
there's no backup there to help you. you you're just kind of on your own. And I've had the odd embarrassing moment in my career where I've completely forgotten what I was, where I was going. And you teach yourself these tricks, right? Where you keep talking, even though you're not yeah. saying it. Yeah, there's one more thing I, I wanted to ask you just before we go. And it, it pertains, of course, to um, the last subject you were just... <laughs> please, <laughs> please, please, Brain, kick in now. Kick in now anytime, that's Brain. Right, that's right. <laughs> we, we've all done that. And hopefully... Just keep swimming, <laughs> yeah. swimming, swimming. That's right. <laughs> and uh, and usually it eventually comes around. I think there's been one or two times in my career where I've just said out loud on the air, I have no idea what I, I'm sorry. I have no idea what I was going to ask you. But And uh, that's so relatable. It's okay, right? It's human. Uh, yeah. Right? Yeah, it does. It takes down that wall. Mm-hmm. What's the foundation, James, for the way that you conduct a conversation in front of the camera? And then we'll talk about off camera in real life for the rest of us. I don't know that I've ever sat down, Aaron, and, you know, come up with a a set of rules or one way of doing things. Because I I think when you do that, it also limits the scope of what you do. And so I prefer to not have that and to just look, I mean, it it might be different if you're doing an interview, which is more, uh, you know, the subject might be a little bit tough. And you're, you know, you're going to have to do more follow-ups or you're going to have to challenge the person a little bit more. I'm obviously prepared for that. But I don't think I have any other sort of template either than to do it the way I do it in real life, which is, you know, if you're sitting down talking to a a friend on the couch or something, you're not thinking about how the conversation is going to go for the most part. Uh, Maybe I've had a few with my kids where I've (laughs) had to think about the way it's going to go. Um, Right. But, you know, so I I, I don't really follow any sort of set of rules and hopefully it comes to me naturally. And if it doesn't, uh, well, then I, I, I fail a little bit. So one thing I do is try to, you know, you, you go off the person that you are interviewing, right? So if they're someone who, you know, talks a lot or tends to give you two or three minute answers you know you sit back obviously and maybe there are some there's some body language you can give to let them know that maybe they want to wrap this one up (laughs) to get to the next question Um, but for the most part if it's the opposite if it's someone who doesn't speak a lot then I try to ask maybe more open-ended questions instead of pointed questions maybe I'll ask pointed questions to the someone who tends to speak a lot and I'll ask more open-ended questions to the person who doesn't speak a lot. So, you know, if it's one of those hockey players who just speaks in little five second answers and doesn't give you much, that's when maybe you use a little more of the, tell me about this, um, Mm -hmm. that kind of question, which allows them to go in different directions. Real Time returns with our conversation about conversation and TV sports host James Duthie about reading the room. When it comes to feeling at home, there's no place like Realtor.ca Living Room. It's the source for free, engaging content for your social feeds. From key 2022 housing trends to design tutorials, Living Room is here to bring you entertaining and inspiring articles. And we'll continue our chat now with TSN's James Duthie on Real Time. I would imagine that the realtors who are listening today have had experience with a couple where even one partner is ready to tell you about their history and what they want in a house and what they had and what they hope for, while the other one will be sitting there sort of quietly contemplating or nodding or maybe not giving off any signals at all. So comfort is a big deal. And what you're talking about, reading the room, reading the signs, who are you going to talk to? But having both parties comfortable, Mm -hmm. both you and the subject of your interview or the person you're having your conversation with in the case of a realtor, that's really important from the jump too, isn't it? And sometimes it's just sort of rolling into it softly with whether it's about the weather or, you know, anything like that. Tell us about that little bit of the art that you've used. Yeah, I mean, you're so right. I think it's probably the most important thing. And, you know, particularly in television where people might not feel comfortable uh, in front of the camera, you know, so obviously some of the athletes are so used to it, but some others are, are not necessarily. And I, I think you always want someone to be comfortable. What I would do is maybe before the cameras are rolling or even after the cameras are rolling is is try to talk about something other than the subject that we are about to talk about. I try to avoid the weather, which is obvious, but, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, maybe it's a different sport. Maybe it's something that happened the night before. Uh, Maybe it's, uh, you know, did you see Top Gun yet? That kind of thing. Just, 
They just check out the new Netflix series, whatever. Uh, athletes mm-hmm. in particular, I think they get so bored with talking about their own stuff that they would love to talk about anything else but that. You have to be genuine, right? It can't just be, okay, he's just killing time before he gets to the subject. And I think realtors mm-hmm. would have to be aware of that too, right? You can't just go in there and say, oh, what a nice day. All right, let's get down to the crux of the issue here, right? <laughs> uh, you have to genuinely, you know, be interested in something else that they're talking about. But, you know, you have to humanize yourself away from the job, right? Uh, whether it's talking yeah. about kids or dogs. I think my dogs probably come up a lot in conversation because I have uh, – crazy dogs. But, you know, animals, you know, kids, all those things, I think, are common bonds that we all have as as humans. And and people are always love to talk about their kids or their dogs or their cats or whatever that may be. And uh, so I will, before an interview, try to talk about anything else except the interview. The one other thing I will do, I think, for comfort, though, is be very upfront about what we are going to talk about. I I don't believe necessarily in the uh, you know, the gotcha interview that I don't really have to do much anyway. It's not like I'm, uh, uh, you know, 60 minutes or something. But if I'm going to do a, an interview on a subject that is tough, I will tell the subject beforehand, hey, you know, we're going to get into all of this and I'm going to ask you about this, this and this, because I think that that way they're much more comfortable knowing what's coming than if you suddenly throw something at them that they weren't expecting right in the middle of the interview. So, those are some of the ways that hopefully I make somebody feel comfortable. Have you ever had anyone just take off their lav mic and leave it on the chair and say, no, I'm not talking about that? <laughs> I don't think I've ever had anybody walk out on me per se. That's a great question. Um, I don't think I have. I've definitely had people very angry with me. The The most awkward interview I ever had was with uh, the legend Steve Eiserman, who I'm a big fan of. Um mm-hmm who was at that point general manager of Canada's Olympic team. And it was the day they announced the Olympic team for the Sochi Olympics 2014. And Steve was also the general manager of the Tampa Bay Lightning at the time. And Marty St. Louis was the star for the Lightning. And there was a big question going in about whether Marty would make the team. He was right on the line. And the fact that Steve was his general manager, would that help him make the team? And that was kind of the big story leading into that day. And uh, he ended up not being on the team. And Steve announced the team at this big gala event and then came right to us to do an interview with me. And I asked him one question about the team. And then then I said, it must have been very difficult for you to leave Marty St. Louis off the team. And for whatever reason, Steve was not expecting that question. And I could tell right away was extremely uncomfortable and said, well, I, I really ta- rather talk about the players that are on the team. And I sort of came back and said, well, I realize that, Stephen, we will, but, you know, this is something that everybody was wondering about, so uh, I need to get into it. And he deflected again, and it got increasingly uncomfortable. Uh, I think if you asked my colleagues, they would say that was probably the most uncomfortable interview I was ever involved in. And, mm-hmm. and I think Steve was probably was mad at me for a while. In fact, it wasn't until a couple of years later I flew down to Tampa to do another story that I saw him and we sort of hashed it out for 10 minutes and uh, hopefully we have a better relationship today. He's definitely very professional with me, but I don't, I don't know if I'm his favorite interviewer. Hockey guys have long memories, as you know, um, hold grudges for a long time. But, you know, I still think I did my job well there. I, I don't think I did anything wrong. I've thought about it a lot. In, you know, should I have waited maybe two or three more questions to ask that? Would that have helped? I don't know. Hmm. I'll guess I'll never know. But uh, for the most part, I haven't had moments like that. And, you know, sports is is fairly lighthearted. So most of the people you talk to don't mind talking to you. And uh, I've had some awkward ones on NHL trade deadline, which is a 10-hour live show we do. And mm-hmm. guys are getting traded and their lives are being upended. And there was one time where, you know, it all happens very quickly. And a producer gets in your ear and says, hey, we've got so-and-so on the line. He's just been traded. And in this case, it was, I believe, Chris Stewart was the player, and he'd just been traded from uh, Buffalo to Minnesota. And uh, he comes on the line, and I said, Chris, welcome to the show. Um, what do you think about the trade? And he said, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. Your guy just called me. I, I don't know where I've been traded to. And so this was live television. I said, uh, oh, do you, do you want me to tell you? And he said, sure. And I said, you, you've been traded to Minnesota. And he said, oh, okay. And he took it very well, but it was a few awkward seconds there where – I was like, oh, how do I handle this? Because, you know, even though it's just a hockey show to us, 
there's a lives getting upended, you know, and children being pulled out of school and, and moved to another city in the middle of the year. And, uh, so those things happen in, in that case, it ended up being more of a, a chuckle than anything else because he took it very well. But, uh, uh, lots of crazy things happen in live TV, but for the most part, I haven't had anybody slug me or, or walk out on me yet. Is there a way to deflect or to avoid being shot as the messenger when someone has something that they have to impart? Like if you'd been telling Chris that he was going to, you know, some team he absolutely nobody wanted to go to, and I'm not even going to name one right now because <laughs> it's somebody's favorite team. But, you know, is there a way for someone who has to deliver news, you know, it's the offer wasn't enough or you didn't get the house? Do you have any advice there, James? Obviously, you had to think on your feet there. Yeah. And I mean, obviously, I think that would come up probably in with realtors, probably a lot more than me where they have to say, hey, you you didn't get the house or uh, you're going to have to come up $50,000 or whatever that may be. I don't deal with as many as those situations. Uh, Maybe it's more so that you have to do an interview right after something devastating has happened to someone. And I have to pick up the pieces with this person, right? They've just lost Mm -hmm. game seven of the Stanley Cup final after working their entire life to get there. And now I'm throwing a microphone in their face and saying, you know, what went wrong? Right. That is a challenging part of my job. Most people accept it, but it's not easy by any means to do that. And I, I do feel it's always a little bit awkward. And I think you have to combine normal human decency and and pathos and uh, sympathy at the same time still being a professional about it, right? Mm -hmm. You're not going to let them cry on your shoulder, perhaps in realty, but I I don't think I can do that on live TV. But you have to find a way to be understanding of their pain and still do your job and ask the pertinent questions. And I think that only comes with experience really more than anything else where you just say, look, I know that this is a terrible loss for you guys, but uh, we appreciate you coming out and talking to us. So tell us what happened on that game-winning goal, basket, shot, touchdown, whatever the sport may be. And Mm -hmm. for the most part, I think people understand that you have a job to do. And I don't think that would be any different in realty. It's not your fault that the offer didn't get accepted. You're just having to be the messenger. And I think you know, if you just communicate it in in that professional way with a little bit of sympathy, then uh, that's the best you can do. In a moment, finding that comfort zone when you're having a conversation, you can always feel at home connecting with local leads, growing your network, or finding valuable content for your audience at Realtor.ca. Visit Realtor.ca today. Reliable real estate resources all under one roof. Now, back to James Duffy on Real Time. You're so good at drawing parallels for our listeners here today, James. Thank you. And when we're talking about buying or selling a home, for example, it can be a nerve-wracking experience. For a realtor, then, first impressions are just so important. So let's draw some parallels for our listeners. What other techniques do you use to keep people comfortable during an interview? Do you kind of lay the groundwork that, look, you're safe with me, and when the camera rolls, I'm not going to be, you know, sabotaging you? I guess that might be your integrity and your reputation that precedes you. Yeah? Right. I, I think you're right on that, Aaron. I think that you you can only develop that over time, a sort of trust that this guy is okay. And, you know, word gets around when you've been doing this for a long time that uh, if you have a bad reputation or as someone that does the gotcha type interviews or, you know, is looking to find some sort of clip that they'll, you know, make it out to be more salacious than it really is and tabloid it a little bit, that sticks with you. Uh, I think you have to earn that over time by, you know, doing good interviews and being trustworthy and, uh, I guess, being likable to these people and, and, and that, that helps, but I think it does take time to establish that. Sometimes when I, I go to new sports, my, my job now is different than it used to be when I just used to be a hockey guy and I cover football and golf and uh, soccer. I'm, I'm going to the world cup in November. So sometimes I do get into places where the athletes don't know me as well as some of the others. And it's like, you're starting from scratch in developing these reputations. And so I have to sort of go back to square one and, you know, try to establish trust with someone. And it's sometimes that's hard to do in a very limited time window. If you only have, you know, 10 minutes with someone, 
you know, seven minutes to do the interview and three minutes to get to know them. Uh, that that's a little bit of a challenge. So all you can try to do is do some of the same things I said before, let people know that you're, you're not out to get them, that you're a decent person and that you're just going to be doing your job here. And I, I think for the most part, people appreciate that, but it's easier in the places that I've been longer where I know people or where word maybe have gotten around that, you know, maybe I'm an okay guy to have interview you or people that you've interviewed multiple times before, right? That's obviously the easiest part of it when, okay, I've had experiences mm-hmm. with this guy before and, you know, he's a decent guy. He's going to do me all right. And there's nothing more, I think, complimentary than when someone, you know, requests you for an interview or says, this is the one guy I want to do an interview with. I, I had a really good relationship with Roberto Luongo, the former goaltender. And he was involved in a major story once where he, he wanted to be traded by the Canucks and then they ended up trading the other goalie. And it was a massive controversy. And his uh, agent called me and said, Roberto wants you to come down and interview him in Florida. He hasn't done an interview since then. And that's because, mm-hmm. you know, I had done stuff with him before some actually really ridiculous uh, shtick type stuff. But, you know, through that, we, we established the relationship. And I, I think that's part of it too, is I'm a bit of an idiot. Um, I say that, you know, somewhat lovingly, hopefully towards me. Um, we do a lot of silly comedy stuff on, on TSN and, uh, Hopefully from that, people realize that I'm not the guy that's going to nail you with, I hope I get taken seriously still, but, but at the same yeah. time that there's a, there's a, you know, a softer, lighter side to me. A sense of humor on the side of it. Yeah. Again, it comes down to that human connection to not being afraid to let a tear well in your eye or to have some quiet in the conversation as well and just let the talk breathe and not feel like you have to fill every second of the conversation. Right. And, and that, is, that is massive. Uh, and, and something that I was probably not very good at in the beginning is, you know, a person would stop talking for a second and I'd be right down in there with the next question. And I think sometimes the best answers you get are the second part of answers that come after a one or two second pause mm-hmm. uh, where the person's regaining their thoughts and then they want to say more. And that's, I, I think that's important in you know, on a TV interview or in life, right, is to just let it breathe a little bit more. And sometimes that's awkward with a person you don't know, that those those seconds of silence, you feel the desperate need to fill them right away. If you can control yourself or we can control ourselves and not do that, I think sometimes that can lead to the best conversations that we have. Oh, and certainly our guest today goes into that column under one of our best. Back with James Duffy in a moment. Follow him on Twitter at TSN James Duthie, D-U-T-H-I-E. And so you don't miss our next real time, be sure and follow us. Subscribe or visit crea.ca slash podcast to enjoy past episodes of real time. Now we wrap up our conversation with some great insight and tips on real time. It almost sounds like an oxymoron to say an active listener because listening to so many seems passive. But how important is it to be an active listener as part of a being a good conversationalist, James? Yeah, I think it's everything. Uh, it certainly is in my business is to, and it goes back to what we were talking about at the beginning with the whole list of questions, right? Is mm-hmm. you need to hear everything that they are saying. The conversation has to flow from that, right? I mean, that that doesn't mean that sometimes in the middle of a conversation, it can't take a complete left turn. If you're tired of talking about one particular subject, that's okay. But active listening to me is engaged listening as much as anything else. And the biggest sign of engagement is eye contact. If you're having a conversation with someone and they're on their phone, uh, I mean, Mm. you know, I can get away with that with my wife or my kids, maybe, or my best buddies when I'm on the golf course. But if you're, you know, with a client or if I'm doing an interview subject, that just, Oof. it doesn't fly and it doesn't do you any good either. So, you know, I think my dad told me when I was going to my first job interview when I was 17 was, you know, firm handshake and look them in the eye. And I don't think that's any different all these years later is to show that you care about what the person is saying. And eye contact is as important as what you're doing with your ears. 
And watching the body language, too. I mean, whenever I see someone with their arms folded and their legs crossed, it's like, oh, you are closing off. You don't want to have this discussion. But the reverse of that is leaning in and giving them all of you, right? Which you're very right. good at doing. Yeah, Steve Eiserman definitely had the arms crossed that day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, you're right. I, I would say if if I have one technique, I don't really think about this stuff much, but I, I suppose in interviewing, the one technique I would have with body language would be to lean in. And I, I think that just says to someone that you care and that you're really interested in what they say. I, I probably do it naturally. I don't really think about it anymore. It's not like I sit down to do an, an interview with, with Aaron Davis and I, I make sure I'm angled at a, you know, 45 degrees towards her. But, right. but I think just naturally when you care and where, when you're engaged that you do that a little bit. And I, I think it works. But again, I don't think people should necessarily practice this at home. I, I think hopefully it'll come quite naturally. Yeah. And I'd like, James, if we could uh, sort of tie things up on an actionable end note here. And what is one thing that you suggest our listeners do to work on their conversation skills? Give us one for the road, would you? Two things. I would say, going back to earlier in our conversation, that listening is the number one thing. That becoming a good listener will make you a good conversationalist. Like that's just, they come together. But also I would say, and this is about as simple as possible, is that I remember one of my bosses telling me early in my career that that you have to be yourself. I think that I was being too serious. There was a point in my career where I was trying to become uh, Walter Cronkite or something, and that wasn't me. And he had to pull me aside and said, look, you're a funny guy. You're a lighthearted guy. You're a nice guy. Just go back to being that guy on TV. And I think it's the same in all walks of life is that you have to be yourself, that most people are, are pretty astute and can see a phony a mile away. And so I think the most important part of any conversation is to be yourself. And that kind of brings together everything we were talking about, the casual conversation beforehand, uh, where hopefully you're yourself and you're talking about something in your life that maybe relates to something in their life. Um, that part is absolutely critical. Uh, if you're funny, then be that way. Don't necessarily try to be Mr. Serious. Uh, if you're serious, don't try to be funny. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's that's probably a bigger thing. So listen and be yourself. And I know those sound pretty simple, but I think we forget about them sometimes. And you also have suggested that being self-deprecating has really helped in terms of your likability. You wouldn't have put it that way, but I will. <laughs> your likability, your relatability, and not coming in and saying, look, I'm the person for the job. I know more about this than anybody, so you're going to listen to me. It's just a matter of kind of parking the ego and then just you know, the humor that you say is so important. And that's the great note to remember too. Yeah, it's probably my fallback, uh, that self-deprecation. And I, it, there's probably some deep, if I got in front of a, a psychologist, they'd probably say there is some sort of insecurity or lack of confidence that leads to these things. But it's always been my, my way of going about things. But I think it can disarm people, right? If you put your flaws or right up in front of them, instead of trying to be the Mr. or Mrs. Perfect, Mr. Confidence, then I think sometimes that can break down walls pretty quickly and, and help to better conversations and better relationships. Well, I can't think of how this could have gone better, James. I know I will when I'm trying to get to sleep tonight. I'll think, <laughs> oh, I should have asked him this or this or this. But uh, no, you are a tremendous guest. And we're just so thrilled that you could find time in what is always your busy season, because that's the life of sports, right? Uh, they they do never end. Uh, I do get a, a little bit of break in, in the summer here. So it's not too bad. But with COVID, you know, hockey goes later now, and uh, we have a World Junior Tournament in August, which makes no sense because it's supposed to be at Christmas time. So, <laughs> so you're right. My my schedule doesn't make any sense anymore, but I I love it. I've been doing this now for I don't know 30 years, Aaron, and I still. My dad once told me, just find something that when you're driving to work every day that you're not going to be like, I don't want to be here. And I, I've been mm. so lucky to find something that I really love going into every day. And so I'm, I'm incredibly blessed that way. Yeah, and it shows. And that's a wonderful thing to see, too.
You are the distraction. You're the enjoyment. You're the entertainment and the information. So thanks for providing all of those things for us today, James. We're so grateful. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, I, I greatly appreciate it. I hope I've given something to all the realtors out there. I, uh, I've certainly used them uh, many a time. I'm hopefully stuck in this house forever because I told my wife after the cost of the reno we did a few years ago that, <laughs> that they'd have to carry me out of here. Yep, toes out. <laughs> Thanks, James. Okay. Thank you for having me. Real Time is a production of Real Family and Rob Whitehead and Alphabet Creative, brought to you by the Canadian Real Estate Association. I'm Aaron Davis, and thank you again for your time, and we'll talk to you soon on Real Time.